everyone, and welcome to Book Break. My name is Claire. I'm a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and I moderate as the Page Turns Book Club. So today, my special guest is my fellow librarian, Molly. Hello. And Molly is running a new thing for us called the Monday Night Book Chat. Can you tell us just a little bit more about it? Sure. I stole this idea directly from the library that I used to work in outside of Albany, the East Greenbush Community Library. They started doing it during the pandemic. And basically what it is, it, whoever comes to our Greece Public Library Facebook page on Monday nights between 7 and about 8.30. We are there talking about books. So I generally start it off by sharing what I've been reading that week, and people can just jump in with whatever they're reading, and there's a lot of back-and-forth comments on whether people liked the books, and even after 8.30, it's still up on Facebook, and we have people commenting on it really all week long. Yeah, and then the next day, Molly tries to do like a little summary of some of the books mm -hmm. that are mentioned, and that's where some of our books are coming from today, because it's been rolling now for a couple of weeks. We started, what, mid-January? Yep, yep. I think we've done it five or six times now. Yep. So all the books that Molly and I are talking about today have been suggested or talked about in Book Chat. Yep. Book Chat made us read it. That's right. So... My first one, without further ado, is called Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers <laughs> by Jesse Q. Sutanto. Sounds um, right. I think she did the, the Aunties books or yeah, something. Auntie a, I, yeah, Auntie A. I think they... I have not read any of her books, so this was my first one, and it was actually a pretty fun read. I did this on audio, and I have to say the, the narrator, I think her name was Eunice Wong, she did an mm -hmm. excellent job. So here's the setup. Vera Wong is a lonely 60-year-old lady who runs a rundown tea shop in Chinatown. I think she has one consistent customer every yes, morning. Alex. Yes. <laughs> so she's a widow. She spends a lot of time doing detective work online to figure out what her son Tilly is up to. <laughs> and she sends him multiple texts daily trying to direct his life. And those are pretty funny. I'm going to give you an example. Tilly, I noticed that this girl at Not Chloe Bennett has liked two of your videos on the TikTok. I think this means she likes you. I look at her profile and she pout a lot, but I think she will make a good wife. <laughs> she went with her mother for manicure last week, which means she's a filial daughter. Perhaps you should slip and slide into her DM. Kind regards, Mama. <laughs> yeah. Which I just thought was a riot. I was driving, listening to this thing, laughing out loud. So one morning, Vera goes down to her shop, and she finds a dead man clutching a flash drive Naturally. in the doorway, as one does, <laughs> yes. you know. Um, and of course, she takes the flash drive, and she draws an outline around the body. With a Sharpie. With a Sharpie, and helps the police with the investigation. So, in the midst of trying to find the killer, she assembles a list of suspects and kind of curates a little group of found family, mm -hmm. almost. Um, so, all of her new customers who suddenly start coming to her shop after the murder is Oliver, the brother of the victim, whose name was Marshall, Julia, the widow of Marshall, a uh, young lady named Sana, who alleges that she's a podcast host, but we know she's lying. Mm -hmm. um, and Ricky, who claims to be, what is it, a, a buzz journalist, a Buzz BuzzFeed Feed journalist? Yes. So from the BuzzFeed, from the BuzzFeed, yeah. So and of course he's lying too. So we all know they have secrets, and Marshall is a pretty despicable person. I don't really think anyone misses him too much. No, no. But, um, Vera is convinced the police are inept and she's going to help them solve the murder. But as she gets to know all these different people, she's kind of hoping she's wrong. She, does, she doesn't want any of them to turn out to be a murderer. She's kind of matchmaking in between some of the people. <laughs> uh, cooking for them. Yes, cooking for them. And she seems like quite the cook. But um, this is... I guess you would call it a cozy mystery. I think um, so. Yeah. But it's it's funny. It's kind of heartwarming. Um, I recommend it, you know, especially for an audiobook. The only thing I didn't like is I thought Vera was described more like an 80-year-old woman, not a 60-year-old woman. Claire, I think that's just because we're 
fairly close to 60 and <laughs> yeah, well, I, no, no. didn't like that description of the little old lady. Right. That, that's what yeah. I found. Yeah. I thought, you know, the characters kept saying this little old frail lady and like she was only 60. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Still got up and walked every day and, you know, yeah. um, it was a little bit over the top, but you kind of expect that in one of these mysteries. And there was a little girl that was the daughter of Marshall and his wife. And I thought she seemed a lot older and more precocious than a two-year-old but Mm -hmm. you know those were just little points yeah but um I actually finished reading uh this this morning and I thought it was a fun read like you said the character of Vera and how she interacted with her 20 something year old son I found hilarious yeah she's trying to keep up with the the Facebook and the TikTok and And the Google yes yes (laughs) and all the phrases and kind of nagging him through texts yeah Uh, I thought it was a fun read like you say found family a little bit of a mystery you know I kind of had it figured out but not quite all the details right um yeah it, it was fun i would yeah. do something else i wonder if she's gonna have another one with her as a main protagonist i could kind of see that but yeah we'll have to so. see so what was okay. your first one molly um well i've noticed doing book chat that pretty much the most popular genres people talk about are historical fiction and then thrillers mm-hmm. and i used to be a children's librarian for a few decades so I hadn't read a ton of thrillers, so when I see one recommended over and over, I think "Eh, maybe I should pick that one up and try to get with the times. And so one of them um, is None of This is True by Lisa Jewell. Mm -hmm. Kept seeing it over and over, um, and people spoke really highly of it, so I finally picked it up, and I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good read. Um, The basic premise is that there are two women in London and they both end up at the same pub on their 45th birthday. So they have the same birthday. And the two women really couldn't be more different. One is named Alex, and on the surface, she seems like she has everything. She's a successful journalist. She has a a popular podcast, two young children, handsome husband, the Instagram-ready house, the clothes, the fancy makeup. She's beautiful. Yes, of course. And... So her party at this pub, you know, there's friends and family, and it's like a woo, you know, lot of fair. And then there's Josie, who is plainer, is only there with her husband, who, by the way, is so much older than her that people mistake her husband as her father. Mm -hmm. And it's just the two of them. And she's kind of like looking enviously over at this other lady's birthday celebration and they happen to meet in the bathroom and have a short encounter there where you know they discover hey we were 45 born in the same hospital same birthday and so they meet there and they you know go on about their lives but is it really a coincidence when a few days later who should show up at Alex's kids school but Josie right and eh, not quite so much a coincidence Josie has been listening to Alex's podcasts and she approaches Alex and suggests that she herself Josie would make a perfect subject for a podcast and she kind of hooks Alex on this um, premise because she explains that Josie was 13 when she met her then 40 year old husband and so Alex thinks you know like was Josie being groomed is there a story of trauma abuse so even though Alex has some misgivings about this kind of intense woman Josie she lets her into her life um, by doing the podcast. Somehow Josie ends up living in Alex's house, which none of the family likes. Um, things go missing, just like stalker vibes. You know, while reading this book a few times, kind of like the hair stands up on your oh, back yeah, of your neck. Yeah. Like, and the way they described her, I read this one too, Yeah, uh, dressed in all denim. You can kind of just picture her, and I'm not picturing anything favorable, you know. No, <laughs> and Josie has these two adult daughters that you learn more about, you know, as the book goes on. One is like a 20-something-year-old shut-in who only eats baby food, and the other one sounds like she was a rebellious teenager and has run away at age 16 and they haven't seen her since. So like Josie really wants Alex's life and 
as the book progresses, all of a sudden there are some dead people. Josie disappears and Alex is left with like the ruins of her life. And like, what did she do? Why did she allow this woman into her, her family circle? And I thought what really kind of elevated this book was it was multi-layered. Like there was the narrative, but then also you, the reader got to read excerpts of the podcast Mm -hmm. that the two women were doing together And also after all of the trauma went down, Alex makes a uh, kind of true crime documentary for Netflix. So interspersed with the chapters are scenes from that documentary. Right, some of the interviews and everything with different people. So so. you you get all these different viewpoints and versions of the story. And, you know, sometimes these thrillers, I feel like they're trying too hard for the shocking twist ending, which, you know, there's got to be some sort of twist at the end of this. Um, But I thought that it was actually really well done and it it seemed plausible to me and it kind of made you think like oh like who really is telling the truth what really did happen right um yeah this so yeah i I enjoyed it yeah it was one of the um book of the month like five finalists of the year Mm -hmm. so yeah i've you know out of all the thrillers i've read recently i thought this one was the most entertaining and it kept my interest yeah, and then, you, you know, know, you had that, like, all the red flags going up, and you're just like, Lady Alex, why are you letting this woman in your house? You oh. just wanted to shake the main character. Right. Like, no, don't do it. Like, don't go in the basement with the, you know, creepy thing. Like, just don't. <laughs> but yeah. it, it was a fun read. I liked it. No, it was good. All right, so my next one, I'm kind of veering into the magical realism or fantasy territory, and it was also on my antis- most anticipated reads for January. Mm-hmm. It's called The Fox Wife by Yang Zi Chu. And this one was set in the 1900s in Manchuria and the final days of the Qing Dynasty. Mm-hmm. And it revolves around a woman. Her name is Snow or Asan as she embarks on a journey to find the man that she is holding responsible for the death of her daughter. Um, and he's a photographer. So her grief and she wants to get revenge. Um, she's also enchanting because she turns into, she can be a fox or she can be a woman. And I guess that's Chinese folklore that okay. these spirit fox people, they're very attractive. Um, they can kind of like suck your life force <laughs> out from you. Um, Sounds charming. Yes, but it, it actually... I liked her because Mm -hmm. there was really, you know, she had a purpose in life. And as a mother, you kind of get why she's angry. Um, But in this journey, she she becomes a servant in a household who also, they have a son. And their son is, they believe, cursed that he's going to die, I think, before his 23rd birthday. So Mm. you have these different storylines and also another man, a, a young woman is found frozen, like, in, a, in the village nearby. So this detective who has been fascinated by these fox people his whole life. So you have these main characters. And you know that the story is going to converge and what happens. And um, it actually was really good. I think it's going to be one of the better books I've read this year. Okay. I, I have a thing about foxes, so that could be possibly why. But um, just learning about the folklore and the beliefs and everything, and then how this Mr. Bao is going to come to solve this mystery of what happened to this young girl, and will she get revenge for what happened to her daughter? And is the guy going to die before his 23rd birthday? I am. So (laughs) there's a lot going on. But um, I really like this one, and I saw a couple people mentioned it on book break. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really new, right? Like... 2024. Yes, this one came out in, I believe, February of 2024. Okay. I haven't really seen it yet, but it looks interesting. Yeah. My daughter and I both got it for our Book of the Month Club read. Mm-hmm. So that's where that one came from. Okay. But yeah. Well, I also, my second book is a fantasy that many of you have probably heard of. It's been around for almost a decade now. Um, a Court of Thorn, Thorns and Roses by Sarah Mass. And um, it has been mentioned over and over on book chat and plus just 
you know, it's been around for 10 years and it has a really big following. I think it's a big TikTok book too. Yes. And my daughter, I bought the first one for my daughter for Christmas. She's 22 and she whipped right through it. And then of course had to immediately get all four of the next books. I tried to get her to put her name on the list at the library, but no, she wasn't having that. She had to go buy them. But anyway, so I read this about a month ago, really because my daughter kept talking about it, and I figured, hey, I would try it. Um, I generally like fantasies. I enjoyed this book. I read it about a month ago. Last night, I was trying to think, oh, I need to summarize this. I couldn't remember anything that happened. So my daughter gave me a very long and detailed explanation of plot by plot points. And even after that, she said, Mom, you are going to mangle this. You can't pronounce people's names. You don't know what happens. You know, convinced, 22-year-old convinced her mother is dumb as rocks, which she may be correct. But here goes. Here is what I think happened in this book. (laughs) So there is a 19-year-old human girl named Feyre, and she is not doing so well. Her and her family, they are poor, on the brink of starvation. She has two sisters that are basically useless, and a father who's, you know, he's been injured, he's very ineffectual, he's kind of checked out. So the only thing keeping this family alive are the superb hunting skills of Feyre. Hello, Katniss from Hunger Games. (laughs) Okay, so... um, She goes out hunting one day further into the deep, dark, dangerous woods than usual, and as she is about to shoot a deer, this giant wolf appears on the scene, and she thinks, hmm, is this really a fae disguised as a wolf? Maybe, but there's a long, bitter history between the humans and the fairy folk, and Feyre hates them. And she says, I don't care. She took an ash arrow, which is the only thing that will reliably kill a fae, and she kills the wolf. Goes on about her business, takes the dead deer home, skins it, feeds the useless family. The next night, this giant, golden, dangerous beast crashes through their shack and says, yes, that was a fae that you killed. And because there was some sort of treaty agreement between the humans and the fae, you know, 500 years ago, that um, under the terms of the treaty, the beast gives Feyre a choice that he can kill her now because she killed that fey wolf, mm-hmm. or she can follow him to the fairy realm of Prithian to live out the rest of her days. And since there's five books in this series, you know she's not going to get killed right then. She goes to Prithian. So she crosses over into the fairy realm. The golden beast guy turns into an attractive fey high lord of the spring court but there's a blight on the land and she originally falls in love with him no no (laughs) they all have masks on because their power is diminished but under that mask is the high lord tamlin really a hottie why yes yes he is (laughs) so even though she wants to escape to get back to the human realm she can't help but be drawn to this this high lord who is powerful and likes books he has a big library he's going to teach her how to read he also encourages her to paint and follow her passion of painting so should she stay there should she go back to her ungrateful family you know, there, there's other dangers and other characters. and They've, they've probably high, all starved to death by now without her to hunt for them. You know? Yes. <laughs> there's a high queen that's put a curse on things. There's there's trials. There's dungeons. There, there's all sorts of things. And it, it sounds like I'm mocking this book, but really it was a good read. It was entertaining. I'm going to read the next one. Like, I can understand why people like this series. Um, it reads like a teen book. I think when it was published it was i think um, it as a in, new adult yeah it, it might have started in teen but ha- since has moved i believe to adult yeah i mean it definitely had some spicy scenes yeah. in it which yeah. my daughter informs me gets progressively um, spicier as yes, the time goes as on as time goes on and it's more of a, a romance 
and you know you're more into the characters than some of the more traditional fantasy that I tend to read where there's lots of like politics and court intrigue and world building it, it's definitely more the characters and and I think who they're going to end up with yeah that romanticy is like yes. the new big genre yes you know the new hybrid genre that people like so much yeah so I I totally I thought it was very enjoyable even though I didn't remember any of the characters and did you ever read throne of glass that was her other series no this I think yeah, I didn't read that one. I read the one that you read. Yeah, but um, like I'm, I'm gonna pick up. I have the sec. I have the whole set because my daughter insisted on buying it. Um, so I'm gonna read read the next one. And uh, she says that actually the series, and this is what the people on book chat said as well. The series gets better, and that the first one was actually kind of the most implausible and ridiculous of okay. all of them. So, all right. So yeah, I, I thought it was fun. All right. Well, my last one, I'm going back to serious now and back to the historical fiction. Yep. Um, but this is a book that a lot of people have been talking about, yes. and it is The Women by Kristen Hanna. Um, this book has a 4.71 average rating wow. on Goodreads from over 100,000 reviews, which yeah. is mind-blowing to me. Um, and I don't really... I like Kristen Hanna, but I don't love her like some people do. Um, but I would say this one is a worthwhile read, especially because, you know, so much historical fiction is written around World War II. But this yes. is the Vietnam War, which hasn't really had a lot of, you know, coverage in historical yeah, especially fiction. Especially women's point of view. Exactly. So this book focuses on a young nurse that volunteers for service in the Vietnam War. Her brother has already gone. He was a Naval Academy graduate, and she was training to be a nurse, so she signs up. She's actually too young to be a Navy nurse, so she mm -hmm. signs up to be an Army nurse in the Vietnam War. So the first part really gives you the brutality of the war and also the trauma of trying to um, work on these men in the jungle setting. And I thought that this part of the book was really good for me. Um, the Vietnam service, you know, I got like China Beach vibes or oh, MASH I love vibes. That show. Yes. We have that on DVD here. I just yeah. found that out. So the descriptions were, were great. You could feel the intensity. You know, there's, there's some romance, um, although she's, she's pretty young and pretty naive. But um, you also start to feel the despair as the world war progresses because, you know, the, it's coming it a goes. lot more frequently. Yeah. There's a lot of young men that are dying, and it is. It's all really, really young men. Um, the second part of the book is after her tour is ended and she goes home. And it starts out good for me. I mean, she's come from a very well-to-do family, um, Coronado, California, her father has like a wall of heroes in his office and she's thinking that she's going to be like on this wall of heroes and her family's going to be so proud of her. And instead she finds yeah, out that they no. lied about where she was. A lot of people don't think that women were involved with the war. They don't take their um, quest for like services or counseling seriously. And a lot of the veterans, when they came back, including her, you know, people at the airport spit on them. There's protests. Yeah. I mean, America is an entirely different country now coming back from Vietnam. And she served two tours. She signed up for a mm. second voluntary tour. Um, so that was tough to, to see is how they were shunned yeah. and how they had to grapple with this reality of how they were going to be accepted. Um, so what... What I didn't like or what kept it from being a perfect five-star read for me is that there's always something in her books for me that's just over the top. And in this one, the romance was just awful. I just hated really? that part of the book. I hated who she chose. I didn't understand it. And also, I think trying to show people what these returning soldiers come from and all the different things that could go wrong, like the drugs or the alcohol or... Yeah, the PTSD. You know, this particular girl, Frankie, she's got it all. You know, her two friends, not so much. And I'm just like, 
just too much for one character. You know, we could have spread that out a little yeah, bit. Give or, the poor person a break. Yeah, just, um, yeah. you know, kind of show us a little bit more about some of the other characters in the book. Did the romance happen after they got back or were they in Vietnam? A little of both. A little of both. Yeah. You know, because sometimes, like, if they're thrown into terrible circumstances, like, right. maybe it's not going to be a perfect match, but it's like, yeah, who's there? They yeah. need some comfort in so, a terrible um, situation. I definitely, I kept reading. I'd say it was a solid four for me, but um, that's what kept it from being a five. But I think, you know, most people love this book. Yeah, I think it was three weeks ago on Book Chat. I mean, like... It seemed like every person was like, I got my copy of The Women, reading The Women, really right. enjoying The Women. Um, I haven't read it yet. I most likely will. Um, I think the only Kristen Hanna book I've read is the Alaska one, The Great Alone. Oh, yeah. I like um, that one. And I, I liked that one. Um, but I haven't read it read a ton by, yeah. by her either. I've read The Nightingale. I think I... I the four that, winds. I brought that one home. Yeah. <laughs> and it sat on my bedside for a while. Um, yeah. So I think for me, especially in a historical novel, I don't I don't do too well in the implausible kind of plot lines. Yeah. But especially in a historical one, it's like, mm, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll have to see what I what I think. But yeah, yeah. I'll probably read it just because yeah. it seems like the book everyone is talking about. And yeah, I think it's definitely going to be one of the biggies of this year. Mm -hmm. So what's your last one? Well, my last one was also a little more serious. Um, and this one, I think, I can't remember who on Book Chat mentioned, just very offhandedly, oh, I'm about halfway through this book, and it's kind of slow going, but it's really picking up about a uh, gorilla Gorilla Gardening Collective set in New Zealand. I was like, oh, I kind of like slower paced books that delve into, you know, what the characters are thinking. So slow pace to me sounds like something I'd probably like. And since I sit here at the library at the reference desk during book chat, I was able to get up and we had a copy of it on the shelf. So I got it right that night and read it. And um, our book chatter was correct. The first half is a little bit slow going, um, but I found it fascinating. It follows this group of young idealistic environmentalists in New Zealand, um, and basically they are taking unused plots of land, oftentimes illegally, you know, could be in a national park on the side of a road, somebody's farm in the back, and they're planting crops and then distributing the produce to people in need. So it's kind of like a Robin Hood type thing. They're, you know, they might be borrowing tools from the wealthy neighborhoods, gardening sheds, that sort of thing. And it follows three of the people in the collective one is a 29-year-old named Mira, I believe, and she's the one that founded this group, and she's kind of dynamic and, you know, thinks she has the big ideas and she wants to save the world. And then the other is her best friend, Shelly, who I'm not sure I would want Shelly as a best friend. Like, this book kind of went into, like, female friendships and, like, are they really that nice to each other? <laughs> Maybe not. But Shelly had been wanting to get out of this collective she was kind of the sidekick and you know the duller friend the one who did the details and the accounting and like how are we going to make this thing work and then there is tony who has been overseas for a while but now he's back and the way i think of tony this book takes place in 2017 like if tony was an american he would have voted for bernie sanders like he is you know just he is full of how to save the world. He has numerous degrees, all funded by mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. um, I think it says he had a master's in critiquing the anti-humanism of post-structuralist political thought. You know, and at one oh. point, yeah, at one point in the, the book, I'm like on page 10 or so of this this discussion between all these, you know, young environmentalists and they're talking about late stage capitalism and intersectionality. And, and so I could see why it would be a little off putting if you wanted like some action right then. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a little bit satirical. Um, but once the second half of the book starts going, the villain is introduced 
and uh, we're pretty sure he's a villain right away because he's an American billionaire. Like, oh, what oh. is there to like about that? And he, his whole thing is based on surveillance technology, drones. And he runs into Mira in the back country of New Zealand because he needs to build himself a doomsday bunker for, you know, when the world is finally you know gonna end and mira is there looking for somewhere to plant you know produce for the poor people and of course they're kind of mutually attracted to each other and interested in each other and he offers mira a hundred thousand dollars for her gardening collective group and so the dilemma is do we accept this kind of like blood money from this person who's destroying the environment Mm -hmm to make our little guerrilla gardening collective viable. So things start to rapidly happen after that, and it kind of turns into this psychological thriller that uh, there's, there's technology, there's like Big Brother watching, there's mining, there's, I mean, all sorts of ethical, environmental dilemmas. Who wrote this one? This is Burnham Woods, right? Yeah, Burnham Wood. Did I not say what the title was? I'm not sure. Burnham Wood, which that phrase is taken from Macbeth, which I've never read, but... Macbeth is a tragedy, so that will give you a little clue. Just a little clue <laughs> of how, to how this book is going to go. But it's by Eleanor Catan, and she won the Booker Award, okay. I think, ten years ago or so. And she was very young when she did. Um, and this book, I thought, was really well done. Like the second half really picked up and you're just wondering like what is going to happen and the last few pages at the end like immediately had me going to my phone to google like burnham wood ending in the hopes that someone smarter than me or more like maybe could, somebody who had read Macbeth um could enlighten you yeah like did that really happen did what i think happened happen yeah and I think this book would be great for like a book discussion because there's so many things about, you know, are you really helping the environment by doing things, technology, climate change? It sounds interesting. It it really was. I, this was my favorite book out of all of them. Um, It definitely gave you something to think about. And, you know, these, these young people are trying so hard to make a difference in the world, but, they're still young and thinking about like, oh, how am I going to impress my parents? And like, oh, that girl down the street. And, you know, are they are they really helping? Right. Kind of reminded me of like, I don't know if you remember those commercials, like the six ring packs for for like soda or water, like how you have to cut them so right. that the, so turtles the turtles don't, don't strangle. Yeah. And so I find myself doing that and I'm thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't have bought these single-use plastic water bottles to begin with. Like, am I really doing any good by cutting up this thing? Like, it it just brought up all sorts of questions, like environmental, what our impact is, if that makes any sense. Probably not. Interesting. But, yeah, it was one of the um, Goodreads nominees last year, 2023, for Best Fiction. Okay. But it's kind of described as a psychological thriller. All right kind of flew under the radar for me so i might have to go back and pick that up and it was on the shelf so usually the stuff we're talking about on book chat is not on the shelf right so this one yeah i think is a little a little more yeah so if you haven't joined in on a monday night book chat come on in dive in check us out and um yep i'll be there tonight yeah well not tonight sorry monday nights (laughs) (laughs) we don't tape this live um (laughs) Monday nights, 7 to 8.30. Check, out us, check us out on the Grease Public Library Facebook page. Right. All right. So thanks so much for joining us today. I've actually been joining into Book Chat, and I joined in at your old library, too. Now I'm kind of hooked on both. Yes, but, Claire um, definitely helps out with, with uh, recommended books for people to read during Monday Night Book Chat. Yeah. She's read a lot more than I have. <laughs> no, I don't know. You're you're pretty pretty good reader as, as yourself, so... As always, the links to the book that we mentioned today are going to be in our show notes. And join us in April. We're just going to be discussing some current reads with my next guest, 
And then we might have one of my college friends join us who is a oh, really avid reader nice. and only works part-time, so she can read more than me. But um, <laughs> Not that we're bitter. Not that we're bitter or anything. <laughs> yeah. But um, thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and